Hi, I'm Jay Burney, and welcome to our Staying Connected show. This is our 11th show, and uh, we're doing this during the uh, COVID crisis, the pandemic that's going on in 2020. We're taping this in May, and we're getting into Migratory Bird Week, with Migratory Bird Day being this Saturday. Our theme this week is Birds Connect All of Us. Today we'll be talking with Tuan Leanders. Tuan is the Senior Director of Science and Conservation at the Roger Torrey Peterson Institute in Jamestown, New York. Tuan is an internationally known conservation biologist with a very long pedigree. And he was our keynote speaker at our initial Birds on the Niagara uh, celebration, which was held in 2019. He's recently authored a book called The Amphibians of Costa Rica, and he's a very neat person and uh, has a lot to share with us. And so welcome, Tuan, to our show. Hey, Tuan, welcome to our show this morning. How are you doing down there in Jamestown? I'm good. I'm good. I'm bracing for some more uh, late snow, I guess. So um, I guess we're not quite out of the woods yet, but I'm, I'm looking forward to spring. So tell us a little bit about the Roger Torrey Peterson Institute and what you do there. I work for the Roger Torrey Peterson Institute in Jamestown. The Roger Torrey Peterson Institute of Natural History, or originally the, the natural uh, Roger Torrey Peterson Institute for the Study of Natural History, was founded in 1983 um, in Jamestown, the birthplace of Roger Torrey Peterson, who we all know as sort of the godfather of the modern day field guy, right? He was born and raised in Jamestown. And um, the Institute continues his work there. We honor his legacy. We have we house the, um, the largest collection of Roger Torrey Pearson's original art, his writings, all kinds of different materials that he left us. Um, amazing artifacts like um, his, his um, collection of study skins, his preserved birth skins that he acquired over his career that he used as his models for field guides, for example, which include even extinct species like hyper belt woodpecker, for example, and passenger pigeon. Um, but we also like to continue his important work. So a lot of Roger's work, you know, in my mind, kind of serves to educate the general public. You know, he's in my mind, he's kind of like the ultimate citizen scientist. He wasn't a scientist by training, but he, he used his his artistic skills um, to convey his passion and his love for birds and nature through his applying his art into his field guides, and and then through that has reached tens of millions of people and really gave people the tools to recognize the world around them. Their, you know, their backyard nature, their, their flowers, their plants, their, their trees, their birds, their mammals, you name it. For, for a generation or two, you know, if you had a question about anything nature related, there was a Peterson guide for that. And uh, we have to thank Roger Dory Peterson for that to start that incredible um, resource that has really um, allowed the general public to get involved in nature study. We try to continue that from Jamestown, from our center there. Well, certainly Roger Torrey Peterson is an iconic figure in the, in the world of conservation and nature studies and birds. Um, I, I, uh, I know that uh, the theme of this week, it's Migratory Bird Week, Migratory Bird Week coming up this Saturday, is how birds connect us, connect our world. And certainly migratory birds are exemplary in, in where they go, where they come from. And I know that you do a lot of work in Costa Rica. Let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit about those connections between Western New York and um, <clears throat> Central America. Sure. sure. Um, yeah, so if you're fortunate enough to uh, have looked at your backyard and, and, and seen some birds in your feeders, you've probably realized that in the last week or so, um, migrants are starting to come in. You know, birds have been trickling in and things are changing over this time of year. Um, our winter birds are heading north in most cases. Waterfowl, ducks are leaving or have left already. Um, I'm seeing a, a switch over in sparrows. I, I've been kind of keeping an eye on when the last junco stuck around in my backyard and the numbers dwindled and eventually they were gone and they're now replaced by white throated sparrows. So we're seeing these changes and um, it's, it's indicative of the larger patterns that these birds are. Are following. So um, a lot of our winter birds tend to head north and breed north of us in boreal regions. But a lot of the birds that we're starting to see right now are birds that are coming in from the south. Um, and it's that south part that's not really well defined and not really as well known as it probably should be. So, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm overgeneralizing right here, but the, the concept that birds just put this hypothetical south in the fall and sort of come back in the spring is it's like a magical experience that you just have these months of cold and moinness in between. 
and suddenly these brightly colored birds come back. Um, but learning a little bit more about what South actually really means just kind of reveals how how incredibly um, <clears throat> challenging these journeys are and how incredible these journeys are that happen during these months that we don't see our birds. So it's easy to think that all these beautiful warblers and flycatchers and thrushes and orioles and grosbeaks that live in our backyards and hummingbirds, all these beautiful looking birds that live in our backyards in the summer and breed there. And it's easy to think that that's their home because that's kind of where they're building their home and they're raising their young. But when you do the math on it and you think about time that they actually spend, let's say, in Western New York in your backyards here, our backyards here. They're here from about now, early May through what, August, September. Top. So they're here you four or five months out of the year. So when you do the math on that, it's pretty clear that they spend more time of the year not here than they do here. Um, and it's true that they do come here to nest, which is critically important for survival, but we don't really know a whole lot about what happens in these like six, seven, eight months in between when they're just kind of gone south and come back in the spring again. So but one of the things that um, I do with a whole bunch of colleagues is actually try to get a better handle on what actually that south means and, and what actually happens in between the time that we don't see these birds. Um, <clears throat> We're obviously really concerned about birds. We care about birds. We, we want to make sure that we do the right things for them. And a lot of people are putting a lot of effort into protecting birds while they're here on their breeding grounds in North America. But there's very little attention paid to the times that they're not here. Um, so I do travel quite a bit because I have sort of my uh, my alter ego that actually, and I have to, you know, I hope the word doesn't get out, but I'm actually a herpetologist. I'm really focused on frogs and snakes and reptiles and amphibians, but I really like birds too. So I kind of combine all my different interests and I, I have been working in Latin America for a long time studying amphibians and reptiles, um, but increasingly also birds. And um, um, as, a, as a licensed bird bander, I've been increasingly involved in bird banding studies in Central America. So during my travels down to Central America and Costa Rica, Panama, and previously in many other places as well, I, I tried to connect areas and, and try to find time uh, um, to, to ban local birds and look for migratory birds during our winter season when they're not here to see where exactly they go. So, um, for example, if you look at the, um, the bird guide for the birds of Costa Rica, you'll see that a lot of the, the distribution maps for migratory birds just completely shade in the entire country, which is not really true. They're not everywhere in the country. They, they go to pretty specific places. So through my work and through my ability to work with other researchers and with students as well, um, we've been able to do migratory bird banding in quite a few different places to kind of get a better handle on where exactly these different migratory birds go. And we're finding some really, really interesting things. So um, to give you an example, we're we're able to catch um, misnat bands and then release again uh, migratory birds like chestnut sided warblers, which are pretty widespread in most of Costa Rica. Um, and uh, we're finding those just about everywhere. But if we're in a, in a position where we can ban repeatedly in the same area, we're often getting recaptures of birds that we've banned in previous years. So, um, one of the interesting things that um, I've been doing for some time. It's like I run a tropical biology course for 27 years now. I'm getting old. Um, where we go to the same location every year with high school students. We have a bunch of active research programs that we continue on every year. We come back with different students. We build on previous years' research. And one of the things that we've been doing for probably a good 16 years running, 17 years running, is is banned migratory birds in that area. So, so for a long period of time, we're in the same exact place, which is on the Caribbean slope of Costa Rica in the middle of nowhere, absolutely in the middle of nowhere. We're in this probably one of the more remote places in Costa Rica in this free forest area. We factor in our students and our equipment. We just plunk our stuff down and we stay there for two weeks and study the area there. We're literally about 12 miles from the nearest village and it's just completely surrounded by primary rainforest or you're just in the rainforest proper like it doesn't get more remote and more rainforest than that we put our nets up and we catch all kinds of cool local birds but we're catching some of our migrants like those chestnut sided warblers we're catching uh ruby throated hummingbirds we're catching in recent years golden wing warblers we actually are catching golden wing warblers and recapturing exactly the same bird year after year for several years running 
because we go back to the same place at the same window of time, the same roughly first two weeks of March, let's say. Um, so this is providing us some really interesting information because anybody who's ever put a, a hummingbird feeder in their backyard will probably know that, you know, if you didn't wait too long and you have a healthy population of hummingbirds coming to your feeders for years and one year you forget to put your feeder out, you've heard so many um, anecdotal stories of people having hummingbirds showing up at their kitchen window wondering where the feeder is because they haven't put it out yet, right? So it's birds know, birds know what to expect because it's the same birds that come back to the same places. They nest roughly in the same areas, they come to the same feeders, they come to your backyard. So we, we know also from banding studies and putting uniquely numbered bands on these birds that birds come back to the same places to breed every year. They come back to your backyard every year. It's your hummingbird that comes back. But the cool thing is that they do exactly the same thing on the other end. We're finding out now more and more as we're sort of collecting information that birds don't just go south. They go to a very specific place over and over again. And where exactly that place is, is clearly important to know if we want to protect these birds through their migratory pathway. So golden wing warblers, you know, are... They're tanking. They're not doing well here in the north uh, for a number of different reasons. So, if we're finding out that specific wallowing wilders go to exactly the same area every year to winter, then we need to protect those areas. We need to know where those areas are. We need to know for sure that those areas are protected. Because if we lose them on the wintering grounds, they're just not going to come back here either. Um, that, I think that's whole, a really oh, go ahead. Yeah. Like I said, that whole route, that travel route, is so critical, and we're mm -hmm. learning. In Western New York now, how important our area is. The neotropical birds, and we're getting the chestnut side of the warblers now. We're getting the ruby throated hummingbirds, who, by the way, have pestered me if I'm late. Um, <laughs> Excellent. But we're, we're understanding that we literally here in the Niagara region, we have this globally significant, important bird area. We have birds mm -hmm. that connect us to Central America, South America, the Amazon. They come here in the summer, they, they breed, they have babies, they go back there. We have birds here in other seasons that in the winter that go to the Arctic or to the boreal coast. We're so connected by the birds that, that come through here and just learning how to protect those areas, including this area, is such a critical mission that, that we have to work hard on because we're, we're not only the golden winged warblers in trouble, but so many different birds are in trouble and it's because of habitat loss. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and we often don't even know what that habitat is. So we're losing it wholesale and we're only finding out afterwards that specific parts were critical to specific population. And I think the same is true outside of this region. And you're absolutely right. I think that this migratory bird connection is such a great metaphor for how nature is connected, how all of our different backyards are connected. And I think that's that's one of my most you know, biggest. I think it's probably the biggest driver for me to better understand you know, how the world is tied together. You know, we often kind of like uh, in our mind compartmentalize our lives, but I think we kind of have a tendency to do the same thing for nature, and uh, it just doesn't work that way. Nature just doesn't work that way. You said you're a herpetologist. I know you've written a really wonderful book uh, on the amphibians of Costa Rica, and that's where mm -hmm. a lot of your your work has been. How do you? Uh, Connect. I mean, habitats are complicated things. And they, they, a lot of different animals and plants rely on them. So, how how does the amphibian world connect to the bird world? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it, it's obviously connected, and, and like the migratory bird conundrum, we just often don't really know until it's too late. We're losing species and suddenly realizing that that snowballs through the ecosystem. Um, yeah. So. Amphibians currently are probably the fastest, are the fastest declining group of vertebrates on the planet. So if you look at declines in any animal type, mammals, birds, fish, you name it, um, amphibians are declining faster than any other group, um, primarily through loss of habitat. And amphibians are um, they're relatively sensitive to environmental changes, um, you know, especially out in temperate zones. Um, when you think about the life cycle of an amphibian, it's been part of their life in the water, and then they leave water and come on land. Um, they have this permeable skin, so it, it, it allows gases and fluids to go through their skin. So amphibians are very sensitive to pollutants because they do go right through their skin into their system. It can impact them directly very quickly. Um, they don't really have um, the ability to accumulate a lot of Toxins. So, for example, in raptors, you have the sort of bioaccumulation of, of toxins, for example, that sort of cascade up the, the food chain and accumulate into the top predators. 
Amphibians are just directly impacted. So they, they absorb toxins from the environment, from the air and from the water through their skin, and they just disappear really quickly. Um, they're very sensitive to UV radiation. So losing the canopy in the forest habitat, for example, and increasing the amount of sunshine coming in will impact them. Um, temperature changes are impacting them. Um, and, and one of the biggest challenges, I think, for amphibians in the last few several decades has been this outbreak of a uh, fungal disease called, um, um, it has a nice scientific name, the Trichocotridium dendrobotides, which even herpetologists don't want to pronounce too often, so they, they abbreviate it to BD. But there's a fungal disease, BD, it's called, um, a, it's a type of um, chitrid fungus. It's, it's well, probably one of the most common fungi around, it's a, it's a type of soil fungus. And there are tens of thousands of different species of those, but one species in particular only impacts amphibians. That actually, uh, it, it impacts the skin of amphibians and it keratinizes their skin in certain parts. Um, you know, keratin is stuff that your hair is made of, your fingernails. So it, it, in essence, hardens the skin of these amphibians. And it particularly impacts the areas where most of the fluid exchange and gas exchange takes place. So these amphibians in adult stage will actually get impacted and, and it it impacts the way they're metabolizing fluids and gases, and it kills them fairly quickly when they get infected with it. Um, this is a wow. fungus that's been it's been all over the world, so it's really been declining amphibian populations all over the planet. So we've lost quite a few species, and and the species that are surviving are surviving in greatly reduced numbers right now. Twan, we really appreciate that you're part of the Western Europe landscape as well as the Central American landscape. We love the work that you're doing and really appreciate that you're here. People can visit you or at least visit the Roger Torrey Peters Institute in Jamestown, New York. If you haven't been there, you've got to get there. And the connection that we're talking about, whether it's amphibians or insects or birds, we can work in Western New York to conserve places like the Amazon, like the Costa Rican cloud forest, like the Arctic. And that's part of the big connection that we need to know about. We need to work here to preserve these baby birds that go down there and live their winters where you see them. And just again, thank you for visiting with us today. I really appreciate that you've spent some time with us this morning. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.